Well, my friends, this morning we're, we're starting a new uh, eight-week series on the book of Daniel. And so today, a lot of this will be kind of providing background and context so you understand all that's to come. Uh, but some of you may remember if you grew up going to Sunday school, you probably heard some stories like Daniel in the lion's den or the story about the fiery furnace. Okay, those are part of the Daniel story. Um, but there's a whole lot more than that that's to it. And so um, here's a little background, and then we'll, we'll walk this forward and, and make some connections to our lives today. But understand that the book of Daniel takes place in what is known historically as the Babylonian exile. And the Babylonian exile uh, actually is the context for a lot of what's in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, of course, is also what we might call the Hebrew Bible. And it's, it really provides a lot of the background to the Christian faith. So there's a lot of important pieces to the bigger story here. But let me um, just explain a couple of things. Uh, many of you, you may know that when the nation of Israel first became uh, a thing, uh, there was 12 tribes that made up the nation of Israel. And uh, those tribes of people, they had, um, they had come into this land. Uh, they had conquered it and taken it over themselves. And they lived there. Well, uh, of course, uh, humans have not changed at all over uh, the 3,000 and more years uh, that are going on. And so people continue to fight over that land today, as we see, and it's painful and difficult. And humans in general continue to do a lot of harsh things, don't we? But what happened in Daniel's day was this. So first of all, um, we're going to jump back in time 2,700 years ago. Nation of Israel's 12 tribes, and the first conquering of them happens. The Assyrians are the world power, and they take over 10 tribes in the north of Israel. They take it over, and they take over, when the Assyrians took over a place, they, they took a lot of the people away, moved them somewhere else, and then other people they were taking over, they brought, mixed them in, and their goal was to destroy uh, those they conquested. They wanted to destroy their sense of national community, ethnicity, and they just mixed them all up. And that was one of the ways that they tried to maintain control over areas, okay? So 2,700 or so years ago, the Assyrians did that to the 10 northern tribes of Israel. 100 years later, 2,600 years ago, the Babylonians are the new power. They wipe out, they take over the Assyrians, and now they're going to come and attack what's left of Israel. They're expanding their territory, and this is where Daniel comes into play, right? So Jerusalem is the center of uh, the southern part of Israel. It is the capital, um, and Jerusalem has something um, really going for it. They have this incredibly uh, safe, impenetrable wall, and in fact, Syrians tried to take them over before, and they couldn't get them, but now the Babylonians are there, and they're ready to, to make things happen, and this is the, 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 now the context for the rest of the book of Daniel. As the Babylonians will conquer them, they keep away into exile. And Daniel is one of those that gets taken away. Now, a couple things then, uh, themes here that are important to think about. One big question that the book of Daniel is trying to answer is where is God in the midst of the tragedy in our lives, the pain in our lives, the suffering in our lives, the things going on in the world, where is God at in the midst of that? Okay, Daniel's trying to answer that question. The book of Daniel is also trying to answer the question, how do you live your faith authentically in a culture that is constantly calling for compromise? Okay, now, of course, in Daniel's version of that, it was radically different than ours, right? Uprooted from his life, taken and transplanted somewhere else, and um, forced, another culture forced upon him, okay? Most of us have not had that experience. But we do know the experience, I think, of a culture constantly pulling and pushing at it, pulling us in lots of directions, and we're saying, well, how do I live my faith? How can I be authentic to who I am, to what my heritage and my tradition are? How do I live this out? So those are kind of the key pieces that we're going to play all throughout this series. And today we're going to get this kind of backdrop of, of the setup of how it all happened. So let's dive in. The beginning of what we read. It was the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah. King Nebuchadnezzar. Do I keep cutting in and out? Yeah. Let's trade.
Kyle, there we go. So we did get new speakers. They're hooked up, and they sound great. Sometimes our microphones are giving us problems. We're not sure. Thank you, Kyle. Okay, we'll go with this. Kyle's going to try to make me sound good. He's got a, we got different voices, so. Okay, so here we are. We're going to jump in. It was the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon declared war on Jerusalem and besieged the city. The master, that's God, handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him along with some of the furnishings of the temple of God. Nebuchadnezzar took the king and furnishings to the country of Babylon, the ancient Shinar, and he put the furnishings in the sacred treasury. Okay, quickly, let's just see what's happening here. So uh, it says that Jerusalem was besieged. What does it mean for a place to be under siege? What does that mean? What's that? Under attack. And what's happening in this situation when they're under attack? They are trapped. They're trapped in the city. Uh, So it's great. They've got great defenses, but um, eventually supply is run out, right? Now, the Assyrians gave up 100 years earlier when they tried to take them over. They just couldn't get there. But the Babylonians, they're going to get the job done. So they get the city under siege. They capture it. And, uh, but what's really interesting here is the way that the writer of Daniel ascribes uh, who was it that had the agency to make this happen. Who made it happen according to the writer of Daniel? God. God. He says, the master God handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him. So what's that all about? So understand in the in an ancient mindset, war was a way to show whose God was the real God or the stronger God, right? And so the Assyrians had their own gods, the Babylonians had their own gods, the Jewish folks had their own God. And so if you get defeated, you've got a couple of options. Okay, one option would be to say, well, I guess our God isn't the one and only most powerful God, or you have to come up with another way to make sense out of this, which is what they're doing. And so the the Hebrew mindset here is to say the only way that we could have been defeated is if our God let it happen. The only way it could have happened is if our God actually intentionally handed us over. Okay, so understand these folks, their lives have been destroyed, right? Their lives have been destroyed. Um, Horrific things have happened to them, and they're going, where is God in the midst of this? How could this have happened? We thought our God was the one and true God. What is going on here? And so their way of understanding this is to say, well, clearly God did this to us because we deserved it. That was their way of thinking about it. And in fact, a lot of the Old Testament prophets speak to this. The Old Testament prophets are saying, hey, Jerusalem, hey, Israelites, get your act together. You are not, you are not behaving in a way that is faithful to what we believe. Um, you are not honoring God with your lives, and, more, and, and moreover, um, you are not taking care of one another, and those with power are misusing, they're abusing their power over those that don't have it. Does any of this sound familiar? Ring any bells? Human nature, it's a wonderful thing. We continue to see these themes come up again and again, and we as people, we acknowledge that we are broken people. And so anyway, in the, in the Hebrew mindset, they're trying to make sense out of what's happened to them. And they say, clearly, God did this to us because we deserved it. Now, let's just um, clear, clarify something right off the top. Because our theology is different than that theology. Okay, we do not look at war and say, oh, this is a war between gods and the greater God's going to win this war. That's not how we think about war, I hope. Okay. Now, like the Hebrew people, like this Jewish mindset, we do believe that God is always with us, even and especially in the midst of sorrow, even and especially in the midst of pain and, tr- and struggle. And we're going to see this theme throughout the book of Daniel. God is with them. But we do not believe that God makes bad things happen to us for any reason, not because we deserve it, not to teach us a lesson, not to test our faith. We don't think our theology here is not that God ever does that. God doesn't cause pain. What we do believe is that as humans exercise free will, as life happens, and we all know that life is hard, and life is full of good news and bad news and highs and lows, and part of being part of a faith community is we journey together through all of this, and so we support each other. And our theology says 
that God can come into any situation in our lives, any darkness, any pain. And as God walks with us, God can make beauty out of the ashes. God can come alongside us and bring us into a place of new life. That we have a God of resurrection, a God of life, a God who enters into our suffering and walks with us. So just to be clear about this theological difference that we see between this Old Testament mindset and our Christian mindset, especially our Lutheran mindset today, okay? So we'll continue to see these themes as we go along. Let's jump in the next part and see what happened then as these people were hauled into exile. So we read, in, starting in verse 3, King Nebuchadnezzar told Ashpenaz, head of the palace staff, to get some Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Young men who were healthy and handsome, intelligent and well-educated, good prospects for leadership positions in the government, perfect specimens. And indoctrinate them in the Babylonian language and the lore of magic and fortune-telling. The king then ordered that they be served from the same menu as the royal table, the best food, the finest wine. And after three years of training, they would be given positions in the king's court. So four young men from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were among those selected. The head of the palace staff gave them Babylonian names. Daniel was named Belteshazzar. Hananiah was named Shadrach, Mishael was named Meshach, and Azariah was named Abednego. So we'll pause there. It's a long reading today. There's lots of pieces, and we'll just take it as we go. So first of all, notice there was special treatment for some people, wasn't there? Daniel was from the, the royal family or the nobility class, and so he was selected with some others for a special program. And so as the Babylonians took over people groups as they conquered land, um, they needed help in managing all of it. They needed help. They needed people who spoke different languages, who understood different cultures, who could be a part of their, their managing of the kingdom. And so the king selects special people and says, I want you to do what with them? What, what were they going to do with them? Indoctrinate. The word is indoctrinate them. It says indoctrinate them in the Babylonian language, in the lore of magic and fortune telling. So step one is we're going to teach them uh, all about our culture. We want them to to know it, to understand it, but then they take it a step further. What's, what's the big thing that they did to them at the end of that part of the reading? Say it for me loud. What's that? They renamed them. What's that all about? It's to say, listen, you are no longer a Babylonian, or I mean, a, 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 a Israelite, a Hebrew person. That, that's, your past is gone. It's erased. You are now a Babylonian. You have a Babylonian name. You will speak the Babylonian language. You will practice our customs and beliefs. Your past goes away. This is who you are now. In other words, it's an attempt to erase who they were, where they came from, because they want assimilation. The way to manage a kingdom of that size is to force assimilation. And so that's what they're doing. So now Daniel and his friends are faced with a conundrum. How do we retain who we really are? In the midst of this culture that's not our own, how do we retain where we come from, what we believe, what our values and traditions are? How can we retain those things when it's all being stripped away? And so, so much of the rest of the book of Daniel is about this battle that they're going to be constantly facing of how do they stick to who they really are in the midst of an empire that wants nothing to do with them. Now, also to note, um, Daniel's going to be in exile 66 years. He's a young man here when he gets taken away. Virtually his entire life will be lived in exile. And he's got to figure out how to manage this and what to do about it. So let's, um, let's keep on going here and see what happens as Daniel tries to navigate this new life and figure out how to maintain his, his integrity and his faith. So we read in, starting in verse 8. But Daniel determined that he would not defile himself by eating the king's food or drinking his wine. So he asked the head of the palace staff to exempt him from the royal diet. The head of the palace staff, by God's grace, liked Daniel, but he warned him. I'm afraid of what my master, the king, will do. He's the one who assigned this diet, and if he sees that you are not as healthy as the rest, he'll have my head. But Daniel appealed to a steward who had been assigned by the head of the palace staff to be in charge of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Try us out for 10 days on a simple diet of vegetables and water. Then compare us with the young men 
who eat from the royal menu. Make your decision on the basis of what you see. Well, the steward agreed to do it and fed them vegetables and water for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked better and more robust than all the others who had been eating from the royal menu. So the steward continued to exempt them from the royal menu of food and drink and serve them only vegetables. All right, so this is the first campaign for vegetarianism, right? <laughs> it's right there in the Bible. No, this isn't about vegetarianism. What is this about? Okay, so first of all, let's note Daniel is looking for a way to preserve some sense of his faith, of his heritage, of the things that are important to him. And if you recall, one of the things that's important in the Hebrew understanding of the world is things that are holy and unholy, things that are clean and unclean. And in the Hebrew understanding of life, it's important that you maintain um, holiness. So there's things that you can touch and things you can't touch, things you can eat and things you can't eat, a whole, whole bunch of rules around that for them. And, and so this is an example of Daniel saying, I'm going to hold on, I'm going to resist um, this, this pull towards this other culture, this other life, and I'm going to maintain my integrity here. But also there's something I think bigger going on here. You see, this is a point of victory um, from the Hebrew perspective, right? How did they come out of those 10 days, Daniel and his friends? Well, they were healthier. They were more robust. Clearly, their beliefs and practices, even though they had been defeated and conquered, this is proof that what they believed was superior, that their, the practices that, that had been handed down to them were good, could be trusted. And by extension, that means that their God could be trusted, right? This is a reminder for them that this defeat does not mean that everything they ever thought, everything they ever believed is bad and wrong and, and dead. This is, a, this is an example for them of, wait, no, where I come from, there's, it's good, it's right, I can trust God. That's what's going on in this story about the food here, Okay. So anyway, Daniel finds a way to not compromise. He uses a, his, his ability to connect with, um, with this uh, steward. It, says that, it said that the, the, the head guy here um, liked Daniel by God's grace, and so he's able to work a deal out here where he can hold on to this sense of where he comes from and what he believes, okay? All right, we have one last section to read, and then we'll wrap things up. So verse 17, it says... God gave these four young men knowledge and skill in both books and life. And in addition, Daniel was gifted in understanding all sorts of visions and dreams. And at the end of the time set aside by the king for their training, the head of the royal staff brought them into Nebuchadnezzar. When the king interviewed them, he found them far superior to all the other young men. None were a match for Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they took their place in the king's service. Whenever the king consulted them on anything, on books or on life, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his kingdom put together. Daniel continued in the king's service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. As I said, that's 66 years later. So this is the context, again, for the rest of the book of Daniel and the background for these other stories that we're going to be trying to make sense out of over these weeks to come. These four Hebrew young men are now in the service of the Babylonian king, and they're trying to remain faithful to their roots and their God. And what we read in this last passage, part of the passage, is that God was with them. They excelled, right? The, the, the writer of Daniel wants us to know that they were 10 times better than any of the other young men who were in the king's service. And certainly as we see the stories unfold, we will find that Daniel is indeed um, gifted with some special gifts. He's able to interpret visions. Um, Daniel is able to understand things that many others can't make any sense of. And because of that, um, he's able to accomplish some pretty, some pretty incredible things. So in the weeks to come, um, we have stories like Daniel in the lion's den. Right? Um, we, have, we have the story of the fiery furnace. Um, we're going to have a story about angel visitation. And then some stories about some really crazy, incredible visions um, that the king has that Daniel is able to interpret and make some sense out of. Um, for those of you that grew up in Sunday school, uh, you'll hear, I think, these stories in a different way now and be able to make some sense out of some things that, of course, 
weren't the things we would, be, we would have been teaching you when, when you were in elementary school. And so I hope that brings a new sense of understanding. But, but ultimately for me, it's about the questions that this book raises. And I hope they're questions that not only you're asking today, but ask as we go through this series and to think about. And, and again, that first one is, where is God in the midst of your trials? Where is God when the hard times come your way? Where is God at in the midst of all of the, that? But then this second piece that Daniel really wrestles with is how do we live our faith with integrity when our culture is constantly pulling and pushing on us to compromise? When we don't live in a, in a, in a culture where our faith is the dominant focus, how do, we, um, how do we hang on to our faith? How do we live our faith? Now, uh, many of you have heard me say over and over again that, um, that the U.S. is no longer, um, a, we are not a Christian culture. We are a post-Christian culture. Now, some will, you can argue with me on that, that's fine. Um, but I would say that we're living in a post-Christian culture. And certainly, in so many ways, our faith is all mixed up in our culture. And so, you know, um, trying to make sense out of what part of being a Christian and being an American, how do those things go together and how don't they and how do I sort out um, where my allegiance most lies. And part of the idea here that I think we're, we're getting at as we ask these questions is, so where's our true citizenship? Okay, there's earthly citizenship. We have citizenship in a country or maybe in multiple countries. But as the New Testament will argue, our ultimate citizenship is not in this world. It's in our eternal home. It's our heavenly home. And so that in a very real way, our, the, tr the place we truly belong, the place that we truly are citizens of, is not here on this earth. It's, our, it's in heaven. That that's our kingdom, that's our culture, that's our native place. And so I think this, this book challenges us to wrestle with our culture. It challenges us to wrestle with the, 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 um, the things of our heritage that we hold on to or don't hold on to. And what of those things are good and godly and what of those things are just for fun and what of those things do we mainly need to maybe need to let go of and move away from? It raises a lot of those questions for us. So I want to challenge you to be wrestling with that. How do you authentically live your faith in the world today? And what things do you put in, build into place to help you when that compromise comes calling, when the culture's pulling and tugging? What are the bumpers that you have in place to help you live your faith with integrity? How do we do those things? So we're going to wrestle with all those kinds of questions in the weeks to come while we um, dive into some of these stories that maybe we, we heard long ago and we get to hear in a new way. Um, but the good news, I think, ultimately here is to, to remember that no matter what happens in our life, God is with us. And if we, like Daniel, are open and allowing God to move in our lives, God will do that. So I want to invite you as we wrap up today, um, as we move into prayer, invite God to speak to you today. Invite God to um, speak into your life and the challenges that you're facing and the things that you're wrestling with and come alongside. So let's pray. Gracious God, you know where each of us is coming from today. God, you know um, the, the challenges in our lives. You know the things that we're wrestling with. And whether, God, those are questions of faith or just um, questions of everyday life, um, we need your help. So, God, first and foremost, we ask that you help us to be aware of your presence. Help us to know that you are there, that you are walking with us through it all. God, help us... Uh, Help us to hear you speaking. And God, as we struggle each day to, to live in the way that we intend to live, as we fight compromise, as we look for integrity, we ask for your help. May we keep our eyes on you. May we trust that you are with us. May we remember, God, that our true home is with you and you walk with us each day. So we pray these things in Jesus' name.